everyone. Welcome to tonight's um, community call. We are very happy to be back. We took a break in June because we had the Hazura conference and now we're back with a new edition of the community call with again a lot of features that we would like to show you and as usual another community demo. So this time it's a little bit a different format. We are doing this in a, a webinar but still you can feel free to ask questions on the chat. There's also a Q&A option, but we would encourage you to ask on the chat because then everybody can see the answers as well. Let's take a quick look at the agenda of today. So we'll start off with Phil, who will talk about automatic query caching and distributed tracing in Azura Cloud. Then Alexandra will take over and talk about large data set on the Azura console where we made some performance improvements. Gavin will do a small demo on metadata SDK release and how you can add autocomplete to your, to your editor. And then finally, um, as the end of the Azura update, I will inform about upcoming events and some open issues that we have for open source contributions. And then, again, very excited about this, we have another community demo where Vilva will talk about HQL tag. I think that's it from me. I don't need to say any more. And Phil, if you're ready, you can take over. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to hope everyone can see my screen fine. Um, yes. I, good. I, uh, yeah, my name's Phil. I work on the cloud team on the Hasura Cloud product at Hasura, uh, and I'm going to talk about a couple of features um, that are going to be available in the, uh, that are available now in some capacity in the initial beta release of Hasura Cloud, um, but that are going to be extended over the, the coming weeks and months um, as we work on these. So here's a quick overview. The first one's uh, automatic query caching. The second one is going to be about distributed tracing. Um, oops. Okay, there we go. So quick introduction, uh, GraphQL engine already um, does a form of caching, uh, which is to uh, cache the query plans that we produce. So if you um, were to execute the same, uh, the same query in succession, um, you, you wouldn't need to pay the cost of planning the query to prepare the SQL um, every single time you would issue that query. Uh, that would be done once and it would be cached in memory. So that's, that's a form of uh, caching that we do perform already. Uh, that, that gives us a, a good performance boost. But uh, in Hasura Cloud, we're going to have a new form of caching, which is query caching. Um, which gives us another performance boost, which is to cache the data itself that we get back from uh, the responses we get uh, from Postgres and from other data sources. Um, and as I already hinted, it's available in Hazura Cloud. I'll show how to use this quickly. Um, you can use it today. Um, quick overview of the approach for caching. Uh, the responses are stored in an in-memory LRU cache um, that we host for you. Uh, that's least recently used cache, um, LRU. Um, so uh, that means that if you uh, perform uh, a, a selection of different queries and uh, a few of those are um, more recently used and used more, more often uh, recently than, uh, than other ones, then those will be preferred in the cache. And if we have to evict things from the cache, then we'll prefer the ones, we'll prefer to keep, keep around the responses that you've used most recently. Um, and if the cache fills up, um, we'll, we'll empty based on that policy. Or um, you can also opt to, uh, opt to have your uh, responses removed from the cache after n seconds. So you can have a trade-off between uh, performance and staleness of the data. So for example, I could say, um, I want uh, the list of uh, articles on the front page of my uh, news website to be, uh, to be uh, at most 10 seconds old. So I can ask the query to, uh, I can ask the cache to evict uh, its responses from the cache after 10 seconds. Okay, here's what it looks like. Um, the UI is, is very simple right now. This is, um, until, until we come out of beta, I think this is um, maybe not set in stone, but this is the UI we have right now. We have a directive called cached, um, which takes an optional argument, uh, which is the, the, the time to live in seconds that I was just talking about. Um, and it's as simple as just adding this directive to the query at the query level on, um, on your operation. So um, I have this query here. I'm pulling articles from my, my news database with the title, whether it's published, the reviewers. Um, and this might take a little time. Um, so, you know, to fetch all this data, maybe I'm fetching these from remote data sources or something like this. Um, 
so in order to uh, improve performance and trade off that performance for staleness, I can say that um, you know I don't mind having slightly stale data up to 30 seconds, but um, you know after 30 seconds, I want you to go and fetch fresh data from the database and invalidate that in the cache. Um, so because we only have to go to the in-memory LIU cache, um, we don't have to go um, all the way to Postgres and all the way to your other data sources. Uh, obviously, this can improve uh, query performance quite a lot. Uh, some examples of different types of uh, querying, uh, sorry, caching that we support right now. Um, if you have public data that don't, doesn't mention any session variables, uh, so the example I already gave where we have um, a front page, the content of a front page on a news website, for example, that anybody can view, um, that doesn't need to know whether you're even logged in. Um, it doesn't need to know your role. There's no session variables involved, so we can definitely cache that. Um, the example that I just gave, latest articles, is an example of that. Um, another, so I'm just slightly extending that idea where we have uh, role-based data. Um, so, uh, for example, I might have uh, a selection of articles that are available to me based on my role, or I might uh, be able to see published articles or unpublished articles that are awaiting publication uh, based on my role. Um, but narrowing down that set to uh, uh, based on my role to uh, to a given selection of articles is uh, is something we can also cache. Um, because we do caching after we expand um, permissions. So, um, <clears throat> or rather we do the generation of the cache key after we, uh, after we expand permissions. So there's no reason we can't do that and still get the right example, uh, still get the right results based on the role and the session variables in that case. Um, <clears throat> some things that we don't support right now uh, in the beta, but that we are working on. Um, we want to restrict data based on session variables with simple uses of session variables. Um, then this is something that, uh, we're currently working on. Uh, we uh, we want to be able to support this, and it's it's pretty easy to support. But the, the thing is that we want to be able to make sure that we make the right trade off between um, availability of data in the cache and not having too many uh, not having too many cache misses and storing too many things in the cache that wouldn't uh, see a lot of repeated use, which is slightly more tricky in this case. So an example would be articles written by my team, where I'm, for example, passing in a team ID via um, a session variable. Um, access or a team ID might come from my authentication service. Um, so because we do uh, expansion of <clears throat> uh, permissions before we do uh, the generation of the cache key, this is relatively straightforward to, um, to support. The problem is that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't automatically uh, result in a use of the cache that is, is optimal. And we want to make sure that we're not, um, we're not doing caching for things which uh, for session variable queries that slice the data into too many small buckets that wouldn't result in an optimal use of the cache. Um, but this should be something that we can support very soon. Um, and something that we would long term we would really like to support, but that um, we need to work a little more on is restricted data where there's arbitrary uh, usage of session variables. Um, so this could be the same example articles written by my team, um, but where the team ID doesn't come via an immediate session variable but comes from a join uh, with a team table where the, uh, the team user relation is actually stored in the database. So again, there's no reason we couldn't cache this now, but this is even worse uh, when it comes to usage of the cache because if all I know is, for example, your user ID and I have to go look at the team ID uh, to decide how to cache, um, then I'm going to result in an incredibly sort of fine-grained uh, division of data across the cache, which is not, not going to result in optimal uh, data fetching. So um, these are two features we want to support, uh, support soon, but um, uh, right now, you can use caching for, for these simple queries uh, and get a good performance boost on those. Um, availability, uh, you know, this is available, as I say, for, for simple queries. Uh, you can turn this on right now just by using that directive um, in Azure Cloud. Um, okay, and that's all I have. Uh, we would like to have some feedback on this. If you think um, query caching is something you would find useful, do let us know. We want to make this as effective as possible, um, and we'd love to get any feedback as we're developing this and as we come out of beta. Okay, um, the next feature I'm going to talk about is distributed tracing. Okay. Um, Marion, I don't know if we get questions, uh, but just let me know uh, if we do, I suppose. Um, okay, quick introduction yes, there, to distributed tracing. You can read tracing. the question on the chat. There haven't been any so far, so you can oh, okay. just continue. All right, great. Um, so distributed tracing is another feature that we're going to have in uh, Azure Cloud um, that we'll be working on over the next uh, next few weeks. 
and months. Um, so distributed tracing, if you're not familiar, is a debugging tool um, for debugging distributed systems um, where different systems are talking to each other over a variety of um, transports, uh, HTTP being probably the most common, but it might be uh, that they communicate via uh, Postgres or uh, gRPC or you know, any number of things. Um, so for example, uh, you know, to take an example based on Hasura, we could have an event trigger on our, on our, uh, on our data. The data could be written in one place um, and, and, written out, uh, and, and read out using an event trigger, and that's a form of coordination using Postgres. So we want to be able to debug across all of these boundaries. Uh, if we have some long running, uh, if we have some long running query that spans multiple systems um, that are coordinated in all these different ways, um, what can we do to debug the performance and sort of general behavior of these things? Um, so distributed tracing is, is an answer to this, and we're going to have uh, some support for it in, in the uh, initial release of the sort of cloud. <clears throat> the idea of distributed tracing is that processes in this system um, all do their individual pieces of work, and they emit what are called spans, which you can think of as like stack frames uh, in a traditional debugger. Um, and spans belong to a, a bigger um, tree of spans, which we call a trace. Um, so these are all assembled into one trace, which represents this larger behavior that spans the whole system. Uh, and those traces and those spans can be collected in what's called an APM system, an application performance monitoring system. There's various, various ones of these. Datadog um, is a popular one. Um, and the traces can be correlated with any other logs that you might be generating at the same time. Um, they're all correlated by a trace ID. And the trace ID and other information makes up what's called the trace context. And this passes from process to process in this distributed system. Um, that's, uh, so we, the, the technical term for that is what's called the carrier. Um, and it's also referred to as propagation. So propagation of the, uh, of the trace context from one process to another process. Um, so altogether, we have this, this family of processes all doing their individual things, reporting traces to a central APM system where they can be, uh, viewed for debugging purposes and performance monitoring purposes, uh, along with any, uh, any associated logs. Um, I'll just give a few examples to see what this is going to look like um, if you were to integrate Hasura with your APM system. The most simple example um, is that we have a call to um, the GraphQL endpoint, v1 GraphQL. Uh, and this, uh, the example that I've got on the screen here is tracking a call to a remote schema to fetch the data. Okay, so we see two spans, the two blue rectangles here. Um, the outer one is the, um, is, is the totality of the call, just uh, the whole call to graph one, the V1 GraphQL. And there's a portion of the time spent in that. Um, one interesting thing that happens is we go out to this external service, uh, this, uh, this Pokemon GraphQL service that I'm using for my remote schema demo, um, and some time is spent in there too, and the rectangles show the relationship between those two periods of time. Um, and down here, this is the, uh, this is actually the Chrome tracing, uh, debugging tool that I'm using here to show these traces. Um, so this is sort of a general purpose thing that exists inside Chrome, but it also shows you all of the metadata associated with, uh, with these spans. So you can see, um, relevant metadata that we're reporting, such as the request body bytes. And we, we can attach different types of metadata, uh, to these spans as we report them, um, which can be useful for debugging as well. Okay, so for the next example, uh, I'm doing a remote join. So this, uh, unlike the last one where I just went to the remote schema, now I have to go to Postgres as well. Um, so this may be a little confusing because what I've labeled PG here is not exactly the call to Postgres. It's actually our sort of general data fetching, the bracket of all our uh, data, fetching, data fetching work happening. So that includes both the call to Postgres and the call to uh, any remote schemas. <clears throat> so actually what's happening here and this will be one thing that will improve, um, is that there's a small call to Postgres happening here, which is obviously taking a very, very short amount of time, followed by a much longer call to a remote schema. So this is already you know, showing some value that we can see where the performance, uh, where, the, where the time is being spent executing these, um, these different types of queries. The vast majority here is spent going through the remote schema. So that's something we can um, work on optimizing if that's something we care about. Third example, um, I already talked about caching. Uh, so here's an example of using the cache. Uh, again, I said, you know, the PG bracket right now, maybe a little poorly labeled, but uh, represents all of the data fetching that's happening. And in this case, because we're going to the cache, there's three things that happen. Um, we have a cache check to see if the data already exists in the cache. Um, we have 
uh, because it didn't exist in the cache, we have to now do some data fetching, which is sort of implicitly here, um, underneath between these two purple rectangles. And then finally, after we fetch the data and we can report it back, we can also go store it in the cache. So here's a cache store happening uh, right at the end of that time bracket. Oops, okay, there we go. Um, we can also trace across uh, actions. So here's a derived action where I've taken a mutation um, on a table. Uh, I have a, a table called test and a mutation called insert test. Um, and I've derived an action from that, um, which goes instead to a, to a web service and does some additional work and then delegates back to Hasura to do the actual insert. So you can see what's happening in the trace here. We start at v1 GraphQL, we call out to the, um, to the webhook, um, the webhook does its work. Here it does some sort of, the webhook's not doing its own trace reporting, so we have no visitors into what happens, but then when we come back into Hasura, Hasura tells us that we came, you know, we came back into V1 GraphQL and we did some work in Postgres. Um, and then to tie it all back together, it turns out we did another Postgres call over here, so that's reported too. So we get a really succinct uh, representation of everything that's going on um, from a timing perspective here. And this is an example of um, <clears throat> what I referred to as trace propagation, where the context is being passed from Hasura out of Hasura into uh, a second service and then back into Hasura. Uh, and this is happening via carrier, which is uh, HTTP headers. Um, here's an action relationship. So same thing again, um, but this time we're doing, uh, we're, we're joining the data um, that comes out of the action with, um, with data out of Postgres and actually uh, with data out of the remote schema that I was calling earlier as a demo. So this is a nice representation of, uh, you know, Hasura sitting at the center of, uh, of my architecture and coordinating a whole bunch of different services and a snapshot of all of the timing information that goes into that. Um, one final example, I think, uh, yep, uh, is uh, an event trigger. So here we have uh, data being written into Postgres uh, over here on the left. Um, so we have V1 GraphQL calling into Postgres to do an insert mutation. Uh, and then 492 milliseconds pass and then asynchronously, the, uh, the event trigger realizes that some data has been written into, um, into the table and picks it up. And we have a second set of spans over here, um, processing the event, calling the webhook, and doing some additional work in Postgres via Hasura. Um, so this is trace propagation again, but it's happening asynchronously where these two spans seem to be, two sets of spans seem to be completely um, unrelated in time, but the trace uh, correlates them and the APM system can see this and report it in one sort of unified way. Um, some other examples I didn't create flame graphs for uh, are authentication services, authorization services. Um, we, can, we can propagate trace context to those as well. Um, the new schedule triggers feature can also um, initiate a new trace. So every time the, the uh, schedule trigger fires, uh, we start a new trace and that can be picked up in the APM system too, along with any work that it invokes. Um, here's a quick diagram of the, uh, the APM architecture that I was referring to earlier. Um, we could have a, uh, an on-prem Hasura enterprise deployment, or we could have um, a, uh, a Hasura deployment in Hasura Cloud. Either way, um, those things are going to talk to third-party services. They may be your own services, remote schemas, authentication, or they may be third-party uh, GraphQL services. Um, and all of those services taken together are going to report their individual spans to this APM uh, system, which sits at the center of this whole thing to coordinate the collection of these traces and the spans. Um, and to report them in a UI um, uh, in a useful way. So in terms of availability, basic tracing is going to be available in Hasura Cloud um, in the next version release. Distributed, when I say basic tracing, what I, what I mean is that uh, Hasura uh, sits at the center of uh, this architecture, so it, it has a lot of insight and visibility into what's going on in any given operation. Um, so just looking at the traces that come out of Hasura itself, uh, can be useful. Uh, but that's not really distributed tracing. Distributed tracing is when all of the different components in the system um, are reporting spans to a centralized system like uh, like an APM system, and we want to view it there. When I say basic tracing, I mean that we can we can look at uh, the traces that exist in Hasura, um, that, sorry, that come from Hasura, inside Hasura, and I'll show that in a second. Um, and we'll be working on actually distributed tracing with APM integrations, uh, and we'll be rolling that out gradually. Um, and again, you know, we want feedback on this because um, we want to make sure this is uh, as effective as possible for real world use. So um, please do let us know if you think distributed tracing is something you would be uh, interested in using in, in production. Um, and we'd love to get some feedback on that. 
Um, so just before I wrap up, I'll just show that, uh, that idea of basic tracing over here. Um, this is uh, probably going to see a little bit uh, of improvement before it sees natural release, but it's a little prototype that I've been working on. So um, in Hasura Pro on the operations tab here, you can see a list of all the queries and mutations and um, things that I've been issuing against uh, GraphQL Engine in the past 24 hours. Um, and here's one, uh, my mutation that I can just open up. And you can see a sort of basic representation of Hasura's view into what happened in the system during this operation. Um, we came into GraphQL, the, the GraphQL endpoint. Um, and the nice thing about this library uh, is that we can sort of drill down here and see what's inside. Um, I called out to, uh, looks like this is an action. Uh, we came back into Hazura, uh, did, a, uh, did the insert. It was picked up in an event trigger. Um, and uh, again, we, yeah, we went to the webhook and again came back to Hazura. Finally, um, I'm assuming this was uh, some kind of join with the remote schema. So we, we did another data fetch to join with any relevant data. Uh, and here's the call to the remote schema. So um, this is what I'm referring to by basic tracing. This is Hasura's view into um, all of the traces and spans that it knows about. Um, Hasura is not an APM system, so it can't sort of coordinate things that come from other services, but this is the view that we have, and we can present this here in the operations tab. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, but I can answer questions. That's all I've got. Thank you so much, Phil. So there are some questions. For example, Gordon asks, is there a way to force a cache flash for a particular query? Um, actually, there isn't right now, but um, the only way to control eviction from the cache is either it happens um, outside your control because the cache got full, um, or it happens based on the time to live that you provided in the directive, that cache directive I talked about. Um, there isn't a way to say, uh, I want to uh, remove a given, there's actually not even a way to refer to a given uh, cache entry. Uh, it only, um, it's only, so it only exists in the cache as sort of uh, a function of various things we know about in Hasura um, and permissions and all of these kinds of things. So you wouldn't even be able to say, I want to you know, evict this thing from the cache. Um, it should be possible though to say, I want to run this query and I definitely want stale data. I don't want to get, um, I don't want to get uh, data from the cache, even if you have it. Um, and that's something we can, you know, we can put on our roadmap if, uh, you know, that seems like uh, it probably solves the, the problem you're referring to, I think. Cool, and um, then another question by Connor. Um, how long does the query stay in the cache or how far back in the cache will it check? Um, so you have control over, um, the, the answer is you can store, uh, you can store data for as long as you want in the cache, as long as it doesn't get evicted um, because the cache got too full. So you can't, for example, um, issue a thousand different queries and say, I want them all to live for 24 hours and, and expect them all to live in the cache for 24 hours because the cache is going to get full in that time. But if you had, um, if you had one query, let's say the front page, and you said 24 hours, um, that wouldn't be a problem because if you were hitting that enough times in the cache, as I said, it's, it's, a, it's an LRU cache, it's a least recently used cache. Um, because you're continually hitting, um, uh, making a request for that, uh, that data, um, it's gonna continue to live in the cache for that time. Cool. And now Chan raised his hand, so, Chan, you can ask your question, if you're still here. Okay, so maybe later. Then there's more, one question by Lataro. Um, if the program needs to track a query, that logic may be close to the query itself. I'm wondering how that can affect the overall performance of the system, in this case, Hazara Cloud. I, I might have to read that again. I'm sorry, I don't see it in the chat, but- um, It's in the Q&A oh, tab, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow the question, but um, I, I'm sorry, I can't, sign, I can't see it in the chat. I tell you what, I'm, I'll be on uh, Discord though, if that's, if that's okay, and we can- I think, uh, Phil, the question is, how does tracing affect performance in general? Oh, I see. Um, so generally, um, I, I think the impact of, of tracing um, it, you know, it's possible to turn it off if we if we worry that it's that it's a performance problem. Um, but generally, the uh, the tracing mechanism is is very very lightweight. 
um, the uh, the way we actually send um, you know the way we send to the APM system is actually uh, decoupled in a really uh, lightweight way from the actual the work that we're actually doing in Postgres and all these kinds of things. Um, so there should be very minimal overhead in terms of performance that uh, on performance in terms of like the cost of tracing. Um, but again, you know, we, we want to uh, get some feedback on this and, you know, in production, you know, uh, with different workloads and things, who knows uh, how this will end up uh, looking. So we, it's something we need to keep an eye on over time. But uh, my expectation is that the, uh, uh, the impact of tracing is going to be pretty minimal. Okay, cool. Let me just try to unmute Chan again. Chan, are you here? And also, Latara wants to ask a live question. If if you can speak. Hey guys, could you hear me? Yes. No, that was my question, and and thank you for for answer that in in regards to the performance because I I thought if you know, we need to track, we need to trace in, uh, track, uh, trace in track, uh, uh, you know, a query or wherever, uh, wherever the operation will be. Uh, it may be close to, to that logic. So yeah, but but makes sense if, if the, you know, if the, if, if it's a, a lightweight system, it would be very useful to have that information into the Hasura cloud, uh, cloud of yeah. course. That, that so was another. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. no I, I'm oh, I was just going to say uh, another. Another answer to that question is um, we try and do as coarse grained trace reporting as we can. So it, it wouldn't be the case. I mean, you, you can report traces in in third party code, however you see appropriate, and like that would be a separate performance problem from the one I'm talking about. But um, we try to keep the the traces as coarse as possible. So you saw that we had one span for um, uh, the whole of data fetching, right? So. Um, relative to like all of the things and the IO operations that are going on, the trace collection is is really like very minimal because we're not doing fine grained uh, span reporting at every every point along the way. It's more of a sort of like a high level overview um, of of what's going on. And we we do have a lot of ideas for different things we want to add to tracing, like all these different sources of performance related data. But um, we're going to try and uh, be careful not to add things that add very many spans in a very fine-grained way because of this problem. Um, so hopefully that answers the question a little bit as well. Yes, thank you very much. Um, there was another question on Q&A about distributed tracing, which is, uh, will there be Jager and Zipkin support? Um, so that's an interesting question. And that was sort of what I was hinting at when I said um, <clears throat> that we, we need feedback. We, uh, we'd like to have feedback in terms of um, uh, what APM systems you're using or what uh, propagation methods you, you prefer um, across different services that you may have on, you know, in your control, you, you may not, that you're bringing in wholesale as a third party service. Um, and, and the choice of propagation um, format or the choice of um, wire format, such as you know, Zipkin or what have you, um, for reporting those things um, is something we need to take into account there. Um, in terms of just integrating with APM systems via one of these protocols, um, I think that's gonna be something we'll be deciding soon as we, uh, work on various integrations. Um, but yeah, I think uh, if, if you have input on that and you have a preference, um, we'd love to hear about that um, on Discord or one of the community channels. Cool, I think that was all the questions we had. Thank you so much, Phil, for presenting and answering all these questions. Um, next up is Alexandra with the console update. Hey, hi, uh, I will start showing my screen. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, some, some of the work we are doing regarding uh, like working with large uh, data sets and large schemas on the Hasura console. And uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is uh, tracking a large number of tables and relationships from, from the console. So uh, here I'm going to show how, uh, how it works. So this is, uh, this is the console before our, uh, our optimizations. And I have here like uh, a lot of tables. And uh, as far as I remember, I have like more than uh, 130. 
and I want to track them all. So I will click this button and we're going to wait. And this request, uh, th this request will be pending for, for quite some time. Uh, and this is uh, like, like this tracking uh, in case of many, many tables. This is something that we wanted to improve. So here is the, the console after, uh, after our work. And I will click track all again. This is the same schema with the same amount of tables. And now we can see that it will be way faster. And it should take like a couple of seconds. Okay, we already see that uh, it was added and everything works. Now let's go back here. So, uh, so here we have an error because, uh, because it was like uh, not enough time. I will keep refreshing this page to check uh, whether it was added or not. Okay, so uh, that was regarding tables and the same thing uh, is, uh, is with rank relationships. So I will do this again. And that also should be added in, in a couple of seconds. And yeah, okay. And here we go. Uh, everything was added. Let me go back here, refresh the page again and see whether, uh, whether it was, oh, okay. It was, it was added with, uh, with quite a delay. So, uh, this was the first thing. And, uh, and the second one is Postgres catalog query optimizations. So uh, what was the problem? So uh, we had this big uh, catalog query to fetch all the information about the schema, like uh, everything about columns, about different type of tables, about data types, about uh, Postgres triggers and whatnot. And it was taking a very long time for uh, large schemas. And as, as, as a result, uh, console loading time was slow. And, and this, this query was really big and complicated. So uh, we, we spent some time on, on like uh, first thinking about what to do with this query. So uh, uh, first we, we tried to find a bottleneck and the bottleneck turned out to be uh, the part related to columns. So, uh, so what we did was to split this uh, query into two queries. Uh, the first one was to uh, uh, like fetch all the columns information. And, and while doing this, we, we were able to get rid of some joins and improve the performance. So uh, like even though we are running two queries instead of one, the, the performance is, is better. So uh, here we have like one query uh, to, to get all the information about columns. And we have uh, another query to get like all the remaining information, like uh, everything about tables, uh, about, about the schema, except for the, for the columns. And uh, what are the results? So uh, I tested it on, on the schema uh, with about 120 tables. And, and the final result is that we were able to achieve uh, five times improvement. So um, this was kind of like a first step to improve console loading time. And, and yeah, I think that's all for me. And uh, okay, I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you, Slack. Uh, okay, can you let me know if there are any questions? Thank you so much, Alexandra. So no questions so far, but if you have questions, just post them on the chat and Alexandra will be happy to answer them. All right, next up is Gavin. Gavin, if you're ready, you can go. <coughs> yeah, uh, okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, okay, can everybody see? Yes. Um, all right, so uh, some of you who were at the community call before uh, might have uh, recalled me demoing these metadata types. Um, and essentially what's happened is that they've been released uh, and there's a PR into the repo that you can check out. Uh, and if you follow this here, um, and then you come into the metadata types from the PR, then there's this readme which kind of talks about um, how to use it, uh, gives like a demo, uh, all this stuff. So uh, I just wanted to give like a brief overview of some of the functionality um, and then a brief overview of uh, how you might use it. So 
there's there's kind of two things that happen. So uh, the last time that I demoed this, um, there was the working programmatic SDK, but uh, one thing that I realized is that having a JSON schema means that uh, you can integrate these types with uh, JSON and YAML files in your IDE. Uh, and so basically what that allows you to do um, is then integrate uh, autocomplete and type checking uh, in your metadata uh, YAMLs and your metadata.json. Uh, so when I come here, uh, you'll see that I get uh, autocomplete and it'll type check and tell me, you know, incorrect type string or incorrect type expected string. Uh, and so I can do that. And then you see it'll tell me all of the available fields uh, and then it'll autocomplete them for me, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, same thing. So if you like query collections, uh, it'll just autocomplete the skeleton of a full query collection and uh, it'll be linting it the whole time. And if you hover these, there's uh, documentation on some of them. Um, and yeah, so that's that's basically it. Uh, same thing with uh, metadata JSON. So um, see if I change this here, uh, it can lint my whole metadata JSON says incorrect type expected number. Um, so if I close, uh, let's say like backend only permissions, um, remote field, the schema tree ending, remote relationships, yeah. Basically, yeah, now you have uh, full documentation and type checking uh, and autocomplete uh, in your metadata uh, YAMLs and your metadata JSONs. Um, and then uh, basically the other thing that I wanted to talk about um, was kind of how you could use this um, in code. Uh, so uh, what it spits out are these uh, SDKs. And for the example that we use, I'll talk about uh, how you could kind of use this from TypeScript. Um, so the SDK that it spits out is this convert class. Um, and what you can do is basically just import that uh, from the generated SDK and then uh, extend it. Um, so in this example, uh, what we'll do is we'll add uh, the ability to uh, diff, uh, diff changes. And so um, basically I walk through here, but we just add some uh, diffing and uh, write diff and some YAML parsing functionalities. Um, and then this is how you might uh, implement that. And so what this kind of shows is uh, loading a tables YAML and actions YAML file, uh, adding a new table, uh, and then creating a JSON and text diff and writing it to diffs folder and then doing the same thing. So basically you might, uh, you know, read your metadata tables YAML file. Uh, you would call convert.loadYAML, uh, which is our uh, function up here that we put. And then uh, log them out, do the same thing for actions, and then uh, make a new table. And then when you write this, you'll have uh, full type, ch uh, type checking and autocomplete. Um, and then make a copy of the original tables, uh, push the new table in, and then create a diff, uh, write the diff, and then output the new tables. Um, and then kind of the same process uh, for, for metadata.json. Um, and then when you're, uh, when you're writing these, uh, you'll basically have uh, full type checking like this. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much the demo. Thank you so much, Kevin. Yeah. This looks great. Um, yes, again, if you have questions, just post them on the chat. Kevin will be here. Um, next, I think it's me. So let me share my screen. Okay, so we have an upcoming event that we would like to inform you about. So we have a webinar um, about GraphQL in production with Hasura will take place on 13th of August at 9 a.m. Um, same time, basically, as the community call. Um, yes, you can learn how Hazora allows you to build and manage product, production apps faster. And this is the link to register for the webinar. Um, Arpit, I think, will now paste the link as well on the chat. 
So you can click on it and register if you're interested. And the second thing is a quick update on open source contributions. So yesterday we've released this month's uh, digest where we are promoting some issues that are suitable for open source contributions. One of them is a Hasura CLI command that we would like to add to reset migrations. Then we have two issues for the Hasura console. One of them is to add code snippets to graphical code exporter um, with any kind of language or framework. Um, we're happy about any contributions. Um, and the other one is the one we've been talking about already several times. So we are very happy that for the JavaScript to TypeScript migration, we've had over 30 PRs. A lot of them are already merged. So if you're interested, you can just check out the issue or go through the code and see what modules haven't been migrated yet. I will also paste the link to this digest in the chat in a minute so you can have a look. And yes, then one other thing is that we would like to add some more learn tutorials, um, specifically from the Jamstack series, Gatsby.js, Next.js, and Nux.js. And since this is a little bit like a larger task, um, we'll pay these contributors. So if you're interested, get in touch with Praveen um, on his email and he will take it from there. As usual, um, if you have any questions or you need help, you can either comment on the issue that you would like to work on or, or post on the contributing channel on Discord. Okay, that was already it from me. I will stop sharing. And now it's time for our community demo. And Vilva, we are very happy to have you with us on our community call. And if you are ready, you can get started. Yeah, my uh, Thanks for the opportunity, and like I feel happy to be here. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, I hope my screen is visible. Yes, it is. Okay, <laughs> so today I'll be uh, uh, having a quick uh, talk on uh, HQL tag. Uh, like H what HQL tag is open source library and what it does is uh, um, customizes the query on the client side, not on the server side. Uh, before getting into it, a quick intro about me. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm Vilva and I'm a full stack developer. I use React, uh, JavaScript and GraphQL and I work for Vomeo. Uh, these days I'm contributing to uh, open source libraries of a company called Product Right. Uh, we recently created two libraries. One is Tailed Wind. Uh, people who are interested in Tailwind CSS and uh, styled components to check it out. And other is HQL tag, which we'll be uh, seeing right now. And you can also follow me in Twitter for all tech updates. And Product Raid, what Product Raid does, they build like very, uh, very modern applications for web and mobile. Uh, they have different uh, 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 schemes, like for new products, it, they have one month MVP program where they build the uh, uh, complete uh, MVP within a month for you and also ideation to development program they do it and for existing companies they do uh, three major things like set up user tracking and uh, fix the technical technical oriented SEO issues and improve performance score of your websites they are more of OSS and community focused and that's how uh, I got involved with them in uh, in the OSS side and the problem is like during the corona times in product, right? They wanted to create an open source product for uh, NGOs, actually, for NGOs, for people who and who wanted to uh, share and uh, uh, help other people. They wanted to build a product, and uh, since it it was like a social cause, I pitched in and I, we started working together. And we the stack we chose was for the front end, we chose Apollo and React, and for back end, uh, we chose Asura. Like uh, uh, recent days, Asura is my uh, go to library for all the projects I do out of work. And as many people here in the community knew, power of Asura is to query data based on fields or uh, sort data based on fields without even defining them in the backend. Like you can directly do it from the client itself. So it was giving a lot of power for us. We All we had to do is set up the uh, uh, backend schemas and all the stuff in Asura 
and we were good to go with the development and we don't have to make any changes to the backend at all once our schema was ready all we did was make uh, queries based on the data in the front end but we had a serious problem that is readability and elegance like you know this is not my full time job i do it in my free times as a part of uh, open source so uh, uh, i work this weekend and when i read the code next weekend i don't really understand the qu query because of the nestings and all the stuff that's when i thought why can't we uh, create something for this find a solution for this and the result was hql tag hql tag is a uh, hasura specific wrapper over graphql tag so uh, it gives you a short and elegant way to write uh, queries uh, and uh, also to sort, sort them based on the field values um i'll in, in a very short time i'll show you how hql tag is uh, uh, makes your query elegant but basically what it does is it takes the ast from graphql tag and customizes it uh, to our needs and again puts it as a ast itself so this way we can write the queries on the client side in any fashion we want and uh, we can uh, transfer it to the uh, format which is required in the server in internally also we have created a cli for hql uh, hql tag uh, and this cli is like hql tag powered graphql so you can also test your queries in the elegant format which is supported by hql tag but on the graphql uh, playground so these are the two things which have been uh, achieved so far let me show you a small demo of uh, how hql tag looks like so this is a small demo application i have created for hql tag if you see this is my query just a minute i'll make the screen a bit bigger so if you see here my my query i have an order by and i have an object inside which i have to create the field name and give the uh, um, ascending or descending values and same way for uh, uh, querying based on a field i need to create a var clause then give the name then give equal to or like greater than or lesser than uh, and then pass on the uh, argument but using hql tag the same query can be rewritten something like this just name underscore odd or order both works uh, it supports both the thing so uh, name underscore order and just pass ascending or descending same way team id is the uh, uh, field name and underscore equal to or underscore gte will give you greater than or equal to so all those operations can just be appended to the field name and if you pass the values if you see here both the uh, queries give me the same data here same output here but if you see the arguments here the arguments in hql tag is way too simple elegant and readable whereas here it's kind of bit uh, uh, nested and a bit messy to read uh, so this is what has made uh, a, break, a game changer for us all our queries started becoming elegant with the use of hql tag in the product uh, coming back to the slides this is the small demo Uh, i have all the links in the slides which i'll be sharing after the talk and this hql tag is though it is hasura specific it has opened a, a new way actually at least uh, for me uh, what are the benefits it gives is uh, not the hql tag library itself but the ideology um, now it opens a new way where you can customize the queries based on your needs on the client itself and you don't have to really depend on the back end back end things and how it's going to help you you can now actually create organization specific customizations like hql tag you can create your own uh, customization library for your organization alone and then uh, you can actually make queries more readable and elegant more meaningful actually because when you integrate third party graphql apis with uh, your uh, uh, custom backends that can be uh, overlap with field names that can be overlap in the structure or there can be conflicts and using such uh, uh, customization you can avoid all those for the front end the query will be elegant the back end gets the query as it requires in the middle you can do the customization and what is allows is when you migrate between different back ends now you don't have to actually go and change your front end uh, uh, code or queries in every place you can just write a customization layer in the uh, middle and uh, let it do the work for you and specific to this library we have a roadmap currently we are working on building a, a babel plugin 
and how it's going to help us is once we complete this plugin your graphql tag or hql tag will never be part of bundle anymore so it's obviously reduced uh, uh, bundle size and better performance and at the same time you still get the elegance of hql tag and next step will be to uh, build a middleware version of the same library and also now we are getting uh, good traction from the community people are suggesting uh, to add support for other libraries the next one in the pipeline is react swr and we are planning to add some uh, similar customization for react swr as well and of course like uh, every library needs optimization and uh, we continuously try to make it better and that's also in our roadmap uh, that's that's pretty much it is if there are any questions i'm happy to answer it any questions for vilva hey yeah vilva uh, small question here so yeah. like does does this take care of like like how many operators and so on does this take care of or is is, is does it take care of all the things that hasura has uh, it takes care of everything in hasura like all uh, all the var clauses and all the uh, order by clauses oh awesome cool very nice i'm sure vilva will also be happy to answer questions on discord if there is yeah. something thank you yeah. so vilva thank you so much first thank of all for building this and then also presenting this on our community call yeah. very happy to have you thank you uh, uh, marion i'll just stop sharing thank you so then let me share my screen once last time okay so this is already almost the end again from for our community call this month um we always want to make the community call better so we would really appreciate your feedback first of all how um this call was but also what you want to see in the next call because we look at this feedback and then we'll try to make it happen in one of our next calls also if you want to do an amazing demo like vilva just did please fill in the form at bit.ly/communitycalldemo and tell us about something you built with hasura or for hasura or any contributions and we'll be happy to have you on one of our next calls otherwise i want to say thank you to all my colleagues who presented today and thank you again to vilva for the community demo and i hope you stay safe and happy and healthy and hope to see you in the next call bye